23 years old, okay? He has had 11 years to realize that his mother is dead, 10 at the least. And it's his fault he hasn't come to this conclusion yet. Okay, you can make your little fantasy world when you're 12 going on 13 and you can't cope, okay? 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, he finally realizes his mom is dead. Okay, now you wanna slap around your bodyguard because you finally came to the conclusion that mommy's not coming back? What the hell is wrong with this man? Good morning, how are you? I'm so happy to see you. I'm sorry about yesterday and that we weren't able to have a video together yesterday, but Texas is covered in ice, covered in ice. And we've been out of school for three days. And let me just tell you that I found out last night that they might be calling school off today. It's not official, but I got a message from my headmaster who said, hey, don't be surprised if we don't have school tomorrow. And I thought, oh, what? My students, my students, my students. I don't know. Lord knows what brains they have left after these three days of sitting in front of the fire. Hopefully they don't call school off again today. If we all have to crawl there, if we all have to ride on sleds, if we all have to gather the neighborhood dog and mush our way to school, I'd rather that than another day out of school. Okay. Um, now, back to the book. I might not have been filming, but I was reading. And this next section, which is, again, we're in part two now. We're in part two of the book. And we ended with him finishing and graduating from school. And if you will recall, he says that he just had to get out of England because the press was just debilitating him with all of their stories. And he's also very concerned because he said that there seems to be some sort of spy in the ranks. Somebody is saying something they shouldn't. Somebody knows something and they continually are feeding little bits of information to the press. Now, I want to say this. I find that everything he says is so disingenuine. It's hard for me to believe any of it because we've seen him lie time and time again. But in the comments, somebody was saying that they have read Courtiers um, and they were saying that there does seem to be quite a bit of infighting and a desire to, I don't know, maybe distinguish oneself or have, I don't know exactly everything that's going on in that book, but. Apparently there is a lot of jealousies and petty, um, petty games of power within the courtiers and that it does seem possible from that book that perhaps some of the things that Harry has stated outright and alluded to, that there's leaks to the press, um, that that actually is a component. Well, maybe it is, but I still don't understand why Harry's so angry about the stories that are coming out. Like one of the things he said last chapter was, and the press told a story about the fact that William called me on the phone and pretended that he was Chelsea. And they had no right to know that story. How dare they say that my older brother was playing little games and jokes with me. How dare they? Okay. Well, I mean, stop the presses. And then another thing he said was that the press had reported that he had gotten some help from his private secretary who is very well educated in military tactics and when he uh while well, he was at sandhurst he was at sandhurst and he had got some help on a project but nobody was saying he cheated they're just saying that he'd asked his private secretary for help who is well known throughout england to be quite knowledgeable so i mean again that's not offensive so even if there is somebody feeding stories to the press okay big whoop it's not a big deal nobody is saying anything about you now the stories that are running that are negative about you are are stories that you are at, you are the one feeding the press you're the one going out stumbling drunk into the streets being seen with all sorts of women who probably are not a credit to you okay so you can't come and complain about those stories so whatever your little courtiers are leaking whatever little bits of color they have about you and william it really isn't that big of a deal so why are you making it this way? Why do you want it to hurt? I, that's the thing I don't understand about Harry. And that to me is what's so, is, is, uh, so concerning about his mental health. He seeks out the things in which he will feel, he seeks out the things where he will feel hurt, where he will feel wounded, where he will feel um, trampled. If he doesn't like the way that feels, he could go out of his way to not feel that way. And yet he looks for every opportunity to just dig in and wallow. Okay. 
So uh, grab your sick bucket because you're going to need it. This passage was by far, uh, to this point, the most outrageously whiny passage. And some of the analogies, some of the things that he is um, comparing are, I find, offensive. Deeply offensive that he would even draw some of the parallels he's drawing. You know, it, it's like if he, if, he, if he were to say, my whole life felt like I was just in a concentration camp during World War II. I mean, things like that, that it's just like, you can't say that. That's actually not something you can say. It's not like that. And for you to make that sort of analogy just shows the bottomless pit of your ignorance. Anyway, let's get started. But before I do, you guys know, you have to, you have to like, comment, subscribe, and share. I have no clever ways of coming to you. I can only beseech you for so long. And you know what this is like? This is like when I'm in the classroom and the whole class is acting up and I say to them, what is happening here? Pull it together. Sit down and be quiet. And then the poor child who's already sitting down and being quiet raises her hand. Um, I'm sorry. And it's like, oh, you sweet thing, you sweet angel. You were already doing the right thing. I'm so sorry that you feel so bad. The rest of you get it together. And in the comments, <laughs> sweet people are like, I subscribed on the first video. And I'm like, oh, you poor thing. You're the one that cares. But for the rest of you who are watching and not subscribing, subscribe. Okay. Um... All right, let's just get into it. We begin with the fact that he has completed his training and he was supposed to go to Iraq. But for some inexplicable reason, they announce to the entire world where he's going and when. Now that seems like a bit of, that seems like a bit of folly, doesn't it? If you're gonna send the Prince of England so that he can go at least play like he's a soldier, seems like you should not undercut him with announcing his position. I feel like any bonehead could have figured that that wasn't a smart decision. But anyway, they announce it. Well, that leads all kinds of, that leads to all kinds of issues because there's a huge public reaction. And his description of the public reaction is annoying to me because it's very clear we can do nothing to please this man. He says that the country was divided. He says, um, public reaction was peculiar. Half of Britons were furious, calling it dreadful to risk the life of the queen's youngest grandson. Spare not, they said. It's unwise to send a royal into a war zone. It was the first time in 25 years that such a thing had been done. Half, however, said bravo. Why should Harry get special treatment? What a waste of taxpayers' money it should be to train the boy as a soldier and then not use him. If he dies, he dies, they said. So I guess there's no reaction that will please you. If they want to spare you, you're mad about that because you think that you know, you should have the same rights as everybody to live this, the life you want to live. So you're mad at that. But if they say, go out and be a regular individual, you're mad about that. Like, you don't want to be happy. You just want to find the, you want to find the hole in anybody's opinion of you so that you can, you know, curl up in that hole and rock back and forth and feel sorry for yourself. Okay, so he goes on to say that because they had announced it, now there's all these threats on his life. And there's all of these insurgent leaders who are coming out and making threats against his life, saying they can't wait to kill him and they can't wait to zero in on him and take him down and that they'll have special snipers out just for him. And so he's really worried about this. Um, he's worried about what this will do as far as them deciding to take him out and if he'll be able to lead his men the way he had originally planned to do it. Um, he's also worried about what Chels is thinking, but he's not that worried about it because Chels has disregarded the internet and the news since she started dating him. She could not take the scrutiny, and so she just ignores the news. Well, good for her, shouldn't we all? And so there it is, swinging the balance. Will he get to go or will he have to stay? Well, as it turns out, they decide, we can't put you out there risking everybody's life since, every, you know, the terrorists clearly hate you, so we're going to have to call it off. He says that once again, because the press made so much of him going out, if they had just, you know, not kept you know, chewing on and on this little bit of information about the fact that the insurgents were so angry about it, if they hadn't kept reporting about that, if they had just let the story lie, he might have had a chance to go. But they just kept whipping everything up into a fury. And so now that means that his opportunities have been taken away from him. Once again, the press has robbed him of his rights. And so he's just devastated, angry, frustrated. 
He feels like everything he's ever wanted, they've just snatched right out of his hands. Just as he was about to take a bite of the cookie, the bully came and took it from his hands. And so, but he can't go. I mean, the army's just like, no, you cannot go. This is not an option for you any longer. To, to send you out there would not only be dangerous to your life, but to the lives of every single individual around you. You know, what if the sniper misses you and hits the guy who's standing next to you? So clearly, they've made clear threats against you. You cannot go. So he's devastated. And he says, Paul went out and, and, and put out a statement that said that I was, that I was disappointed. But the truth is I wasn't disappointed. I was devastated. Because here was my time to shine. This is the only thing I'd ever been good at. So he's upset again, and he says that the press continued to run the story that he had manipulated his uh, betters and that he had um, gotten them to release him from his duties because truly he was a coward. It wasn't that there was any threats. No, no, no. This boy's a coward, and that's why he doesn't want to go. That's what he says the press said. Okay, well, anybody's all anybody's going to do is see the, um, the mounting threats by the enemy that... I mean, anyone can put two and two together. This is not wise. He cannot go. I mean, if this isn't like, this isn't a big, big, big plot against you. If you really care about your men, like you continually say, I, I just can't so much. Well then do what's best for them. Step out of the way and let somebody. My real concern was that the guy that replaced me wasn't going to be up to par. I mean, I was the one who knew what to do. And if they get somebody else, what if he's not trained sufficiently? Well, he just came through the same training you did. And presumably he might be better since he was awake during all the parts about military strategy. Okay, so um, then he says this, and I'm just like, this is the ultimate eye roll. So the, the whole time you're just like, you're just playing soldier. Then he says, I pondered quitting the army. What was the point of staying if I couldn't actually be a soldier? How do you just quit? See, that's, that. I'm just like, you are living in a fantasy world. Anybody who signs a contract with the military, you don't just get to be like, you know what, guys? I'm done. <laughs> Peace out. I've had my time. It's like, no, 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 no. You fulfill that contract whether you like the situation or not. So they've got, they've got to have some kind of work for you to do, you know, behind enemy lines. Certainly there's something that you can do, right? But, you know, he didn't get to do what he wanted to do. So I guess he just hangs out until they say, hey, we've got some work for you. I mean, it, it doesn't seem like he's going into work. It doesn't seem like he's got anything to do. So he decides, oh, I'm gonna go see Chelsea in Africa. <laughs> you know, can't go to Iraq. I guess I'll go hang out with my girlfriend. So he goes and he talks to Chelsea. Um, and he says, look, I, I just don't know what to do because I wanted to be a soldier, but they won't let me. And she's like, well, you know, this is unfortunate um, because I know how much it's meant to you. And she really believed in the mission of the war. And she felt like it, it, it broke her heart that he was hurting so badly. But um, there was another part of her that was relieved that he was not going into a situation in which he was, he was truly in danger, presumably. Um, so in order to, okay, wait, so he's not, he's going to go, gonna go to Africa in a little bit but for right now um while he's trying to process the fact that everything he's ever wanted is always taken away from him by the bloody press he decides that the only way to deal with this is uh well he'll go talk to William first and get William's opinion and this again it's it's like okay why are you always going to your arch nemesis looking for comfort in the arms of the enemy you he's all the day long being like William what should I do I don't know what to do William Help me out of my troubles and all of the, all of the mental torment that I'm under. And, um, he says that William had complicated feelings. And this is just so dumb. He says, I talked it over with Willie. He had complicated feelings as well. He sympathized as a soldier, but as a sibling, a highly competitive older brother, he couldn't bring himself to totally regret this turn of events. It's like, when your brother said, I'm glad you don't have to go. You heard him saying, thank God that this little whippersnapper's not coming up behind me, taking all my glory. It's like, no, what he's saying is, I value you as a sibling, as a brother, as my friend. And sending you to a war zone in which people are being taken down daily by the dozen. I'm glad you don't have to do that. Okay, 
Why does he always hear the negative? I don't understand. I don't understand why he can't for five seconds see somebody's good intentions for him. So William says, I'm glad you don't have to go. He's like, yeah, you would say that. You would say that, you highly competitive older brother. That's what the heir would say to this bear. And so, you know, always seeing a problem when there isn't one. So in order to comfort his broken heart, he turns to the bottle. He says, not getting comfort from any quarter. He could have gotten comfort from William and he could have gotten comfort from Chelsea if he had chosen to take it, but he wants to be boohoo, uh, poor me, I never get anything I want. He says, not getting comfort from any quarter. I looked for it in vodka and Red Bull and gin and tonic. I was photographed around this time going into and coming out of multiple clubs, pubs, house parties at wee hours. So he's just admitted that he's giving fodder to the press. And then he wants, then we go on for a long diatribe against the press. He goes on and on and on and on and on about the, you know, the demon press. He must have been Satan himself that was corralling these paps. And he says, I mean, you guys, I, I like, I could not get through this page. I mean, underlining, highlighting, what, what, what? Like, I just could not believe how unbelievably petty this entire passage is about the press. He says, you guys listen to this. I didn't love waking to find a photo of myself on the front page of a tabloid. Then don't go out. But what I really couldn't bear was the sound of the photo being taken in the first place. That click, that terrible noise from over my shoulder or behind my back or within my peripheral vision had always triggered me, had always made my heart race. But after Sandhurst, it sounded like a gun cocking or a blade being notched open. And then, even a little worse, a little more traumatizing, came that blinding flash. Okay. So you're trying to tell me that because you had to go through boot camp, you now have PTSD from the experience, and that every time you hear the camera click, it's like a gun cocking. I just want to say a deep apology to all the soldiers who truly have PTSD, who actually have a reason to be very traumatized by frightening sounds. The camera clicking and your connection to Santos Military Academy boot camp, causing you to have a traumatized reaction is the most laughable thing I have ever encountered in this book. And I have been laughing for quite a few pages now. Give me a break. He says, great, I thought. The army has made me more able to recognize threats, to feel threats, to become adrenalized in the face of those threats. And now it's casting me aside. So the army has wrecked me and now they're throwing me to the wolves. They're casting me aside because I'm not exactly what they needed, what exactly what they wanted. And now I have nowhere to go. What did you think was gonna happen? You are a famous, famous prince. You're one of the most famous princes in the world. Did you think that you were actually gonna get to go and see some action? At what point did you actually tell yourself, this is a reality for me? I mean, you have imagined lo these many years that your mother is in hiding. Perhaps there's no fantasy or fable that you won't believe. Okay, so he says that he's in a really, really bad place because the army trained him, wrecked him, and threw him to the side. Then he says that as he'd gotten older, the paparazzi had really become emboldened. I mean, those monsters knew no bounds. And he says that now they weren't just content to take his picture, now they were jostling at him and bumping into him and hitting him with their cameras and abusing him in the streets. And he said that um, they were all doing it because they wanted a better and better picture. That one paparazzi had sold a photo of him and made, you know, 30,000 um, pounds, which he says, you know, that's a nice down payment on a flat, mate. So I guess, you know, I'm just over here paving the way for your wildest dreams with just one picture. And so he said if they could get a picture of him angry, they'd make, you know, even more. They could probably buy a house with that kind of money. And so he said they were always baiting him and always trying to make him even more angry. And I mean, look, I think that the whole industry of the paparazzi is kind of a foul little affair. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty dirty and rotten. But the world is full of prey and the preyed. I'm sorry to say it that way, but we live in a sinful and broken world. And in this world, there are going to be people who are going to monetize your wealth um, to line their own pockets. This is the way of the world, okay? And to be shocked by it, to be surprised by it, to be continually wounded by it, 
is a recipe for utter disaster. I mean, <laughs> the recipe has been baked and we're eating the pie. Here he is completely ruined by the fact that he could not get past the fact that there are people who want pictures of him. And then he would give them everything that they ever wanted by being angry, by being frustrated, by being, you know, falling down in the streets. Falling down in the streets and then being like, why would they want to take a picture of the prince doing that? Why would there be money in that? So he, and then this is, the, remember how I said that he's like over here drawing analogies where I'm just like, you've got to stop it. He said, the paps had always been grotesque people, but as I reached maturity, they were worse. You could see it in their eyes, their body language. They were more emboldened, more radicalized, just as young men in Iraq had been radicalized. Their mullahs were editors, the same ones who'd vowed to do better after Mummy died. And it's like, okay, you can't, you can't say that. Do you understand the work that these terrorists have done to destroy the world? Do you understand the wars that have been fought because of these terrorists? Do you understand? You were there. You watched 9-11. You watched people jump out of buildings. Their bones crushed all over the ground. And you have the gall to say that the paparazzi were like the same. They were as radicalized as, say, as the men who drove into the Twin Towers in a plane. Blew up buses in London. Terrorized the streets of Paris. Rain terror down on their own people, their own flesh and blood. You want to come to me and tell me that these photographers are the same thing? Like, all I can do is just say, you are, you are beyond crazy. You have reached new heights of delusion. If you can make that parallel with a straight face, that is so beyond anything that I thought I would encounter in this book. It just doesn't even, uh, uh, and this too. For somebody who's this concerned about being politically correct in all things, it just doesn't seem politically correct to say that a photographer taking your picture is as bad as the terrorists. That this is equal to. And quite frankly, if not worse. It's like, no, they're not actually like the radicalized young men in Iraq. Actually, that's not how it is. Okay, so why don't you just calm down? Okay, so they're taking his pictures. And then he says this. And no one seemed to give a shit. I remember leaving a club in London and being swarmed by 20 paps. They surrounded me, surrounded the police car in which I was sitting, threw themselves across the bonnet, all wearing football scarves around their faces and hoods over their heads. The uniform of terrorists everywhere. It was one of the scariest moments of my life. And I knew no one cared. Price you pay, people would say, though I never understood what they meant. Price for what? Okay, even you can't be this dense, Harry. Even you. The price for all the privilege, for the fame, for the money, for, for the experiences, for the education. This is the price you, for, price for what? Do you understand the life you lead? Do you understand what you have? Do you understand any of this? What could this mean? Price for, the price for what? Price for what? Please. Okay, so then he talks about that you know, what it eventually forced him to do, since he couldn't leave a club without being attacked by the paparazzi. He had to um, have one of his bodyguards pull the car up to an alley or an underground parking lot. He, he would climb into the trunk of the car, they'd shut the trunk, and he'd ride out of there like somebody in a coffin. Ride on home, and that was how he had to do it. And his, apparently his mummy had had to do the same, so he'd learn from her. And he says that it was, it felt like being in a coffin, but he didn't care. Okay. Okay, so dramatic. Where's the sick bucket? So then he talks about the fact that it was Mummy's 10 year anniversary, the, the, the death of her disappearance. And he did a con they did a concert with Elton John. It's a long, it's kind of a really boring passage. I mean, I guess he felt like he had to hit it because it was like a moment in which we'd seen him publicly with William. Um, and so he's got to talk about it. He's still in denial, still doesn't believe mommy's dead. Remember, he saw all those pictures. JLP showed him the pictures, but that wasn't good enough for him. And he still, it was denial, denial, denial. So now they're doing the concert. And there's nothing much to say except for the fact that he was sort of disappointed that he didn't say, uh, like they didn't give some kind of personal tribute, some sort of small message about their undying love for her. Because he says that he and William came out and then they were a little bit like, 
Uh, they just had said, said nothing about the fact that their mother had passed, like no tribute of any kind. And he said it was just such an uncomfortable topic for them that it seemed almost not even to occur to them. Now, I don't know actually what they said. I haven't gone back to watch this footage. Um, I'm looking at this book very standalone. <clears throat> I'm sure that there's a lot of things that I'm missing or I'm not bringing in context from other books or other sources. But I really am just looking at this book's like, what is he saying? And I'm going to compare what he says in this book like with other things he said in the book. But I find it really strange that they, the whole concert would be a tribute to his mom and then he and William said nothing about it. I don't know. I mean, I, I really, again, if anybody's seen that footage, if that's if that's not true, I'd, I'd be interested to know because it's weird that no one would have prepped them like, okay, so since this is about your mom, you might say a few words about how much you loved her or something like that. Apparently they said nothing. And it doesn't seem like one of those things that you would have gone to and then like thought, I'll just make up something on the fly to say. Because he does say that he had a message for all the guys who were in squadron, household cavalry, um, who were serving in Iraq at that time. So he had the wherewithal to wish them goodwill, but he said nothing about his mother at the tribute to his mom. That is a little weird. He's right. Okay. Now, remember I had alluded to the fact that since he's got nothing to do, nowhere to go, um, no people who seem to care, the army has all but chucked him out in name, uh, you know, not officially, but he has no tasks and no jobs to do with them. He decides, you know, I'll tarry on down in Africa. So he goes down to Africa to see Chels. He also goes to visit Tej and Mike. Remember that couple who, they were the filmmakers who took them under their wing and, you know, taught him the meaning of love and life. And his guide, Addie, who he loves very much. So Chels, he's, he brings Chels to meet his, you know, cozy little African family. Um, and in this passage, she talks about the fact that one afternoon it's real hot and he says, you, you've got to put some sunscreen on. Okay. That pale skin is not going to take the African sun. And he, he, she keeps insisting. And so he's like, all right, mom. And then it's like, oh my gosh, he just called her mom. And Tej looks at him and it's this, this, you know, me, this, this moment just flooded with meaning and you know, he says after that, he just always called her mom. Now, never mom, mom. And she was his mom after that. And they, you know, just this real special moment. Well, mom didn't seem to want to speak to her son about his egregious drinking because he says that it was all a very happy visit overall, but there's a constant subtext of stress. It was evident in how much that he was drinking. Um, and he said, uh, you know, here's the thing. It must have been a ton of drinking if even he could gauge that he was really over the limit here. Because he says that it was all day long, all day and all night. He, ha he had that bottle to the his lips. And he said that he was having fun, sure. But he was also dealing his own way with unsorted anger and guilt about not being at war and not leading his lads. Well... I mean, I've said this in previous videos. If he is this mentally unstable, thank God for all his lad's sake, he wasn't there to lead them, lead them right into the pits of hell. Um, so he says that he was just drinking with, with abandon and nobody seemed to take any note, but probably everybody thought he was just partying and that it wasn't anything more than that. But he said something had changed and he didn't like who he was and he didn't like how it was going. And he knew that he needed to go back to um, his colonel and say, get me work. I got to do something. I had all this training and now I'm just sitting around, um, you know, on my hands, That that doesn't feel good as a, as, as a man, this doesn't feel good. Okay. Well, that's good. I'm glad he's looking to get some responsibility in his life. But this again, I don't understand this. He goes and he says to his colonel, I need to find a way of getting back into operations or else I'm going to have to quit the army. You don't just quit the army. I mean, is it different in England? I don't know. In America, you sign a contract and you work that contract until it's done. Um, and the only way you're getting out is if they discharge you and it's usually not honorable. Okay, they might discharge you because you were wounded and you cannot do anything anymore. And then that would be okay. But you don't just come to them and be like, you know what? Well, I don't like the way this has worked out at all. I don't like this arrangement, I'm quitting. You don't just quit the army. It's not like, I'm kind of done flipping these burgers. I think I'm going to peace out, everybody. Okay, so he says he's just going to quit. Um, and then he, his Colonel Ed says to him, look, okay, I understand your, your situation, but I'm thinking we might send you to Afghanistan. And 
that's not as dangerous. And Harry's like, that doesn't compute. I thought Afghanistan was worse. Um, but Colonel Ed says he might be able to get him this highly coveted job. Um, it's called an FAC, and that is a forward air controller. And basically, you are not in danger, but you're calling in the air power that will help get the job done. Um, his colonel says, everybody wants this job. So, you know, I've got to be very diplomatic in the way that I arrange this for you. But also, you need training. You can't just go out and call in some helicopters and Apaches and, you know, F-15s and F-16s and all this with no knowledge of how to do this. So he's like, you got to go to training. So it's all very specific and... Uh, you got to know the, you got to know the terms, you know, got to know the words, you got to know how to do the things. So they send him packing to learn these things. And he goes to the Yorkshire Dales. And while he's out there, you know, he's loving it. It's, it's just meeting all his little needs to play with all these big boy toys. It's really all that he could ever want. Um, okay, well, so in the middle of all this training, he, um, he, he completed the first portion of the training. Now he's got to go do um, some more training. And um, so he's got to, he can't go to the regular place because it would draw too much attention. Again, they're trying to keep things hush hush that he can actually go to Afghanistan. So part of this training, they decided they're going to do it on, um, they're going to do it at Sandringham, his uh, grandmother's country estate. So he's going to be practicing out there. And um, while he's there, he's going to be staying at just a regular hotel called the Knights, um, called the Knights Hill. And he said that it was sort of fun to stay there as just like a nobody because there wasn't anybody there in the autumn. Um, usually it's packed at other seasons, but at this time of year, there wasn't anybody and he really enjoyed that. Um, but during this time, as he's finishing up, um, being certified and, and finishing up all his training, um, he calls Chels every night on the phone and she wants at one point to have a little conversation about, okay, so where is this all going? Like you and me, where is this going? And, you know, dimwit that he is, he's like, oh, uh, well, I mean, what do you mean? Where is it going? Like, I love you. I, I really like you a lot. And she says, like, I know you care about me, but I, I just don't feel seen. Like, I'm all the way in Africa. You're over here living your best life, you know, calling in the helicopters. But, like, how do I figure into your greater world? I mean, am I even really part of your world? Or am I just sort of somebody you see when you have a few minutes to spare and you come and see me in Africa? Like, we talk, but, like, should I be hoping for something more? What is even the point here? And she's like, I know you're desperate to go to war, but I just feel like, you just seem a little detached from me, from us. And I'm just trying to figure out, do I have a place in your world? This is his response. I explained that this is what I needed to do. The thing I wanted to do all my life. And I needed to do it with all my heart and soul. If that meant that there was less heart and soul left over for anything or anyone else, well, I'm sorry. Oh. Then why did you bring her into your life? Like, that is such a junky response. So, you pull this girl into your orbit just so that you can tell her there's nothing left for her once she gets there. Ugh. Lame. And I mean, I'm not, I, 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 all I'm saying is, is if, like, that's just not, that's just not good enough. Like, either break up with the girl and tell her, you know what, this is something that I need to do in my pursuit of becoming a man so that I could be the sort of person that you would want to be with. I have to do this thing. And it means that I'm not going to be able to be a very good boyfriend to you. Now, if you're willing to stick it out with me, I'm will I want you to be, I want to be with you. But if this is, if, if, if what I'm doing means that I can't give you what you need right now, I understand if you need to go, I don't want you to go. I wish that I had enough in me that could give you everything you needed and give everything to the job. But for right now, I'm not the man that you that you need in your life. I want to be a better man. And this is how I'm gonna, this is the way I'd become a better man. It's like, why didn't he phrase it like that instead of just being like, well, uh, there's just nothing left over for you. So I don't know what to tell you. Yuck. Okay, so um, he says that he knew that, okay, so while he's there, pretending to blow things up, because that's his whole point. He's supposed to be calling in um, air control, and then he's supposed to be um, 
you know, dispatching them and pretend blowing things up. Okay. So while he's there, Pa also, by the way, is at Sandringham, but he, Pa has not come to visit him. And it's just like, yeah, cause you're working. If you're trying to keep a low profile and then the heir to the throne shows up, it might blow your cover. He says, Pa knew I was living at Knight's Hill, knew what I was up to. He's just down the road at Sandringham on an extended visit. Yeah, he never dropped in, giving me space, I guess. But also, he's still very much in his newlywed face, even though the wedding was more than two years prior. So he's just throwing his dad under the bus, being like, that old kook, he was right there. He could have come over and said, hey, but he didn't. You know, here I am doing my work. He's just right up the road, didn't even bother. I mean, yeah, I'm trying to keep everything on the down low, but you, you'd think your dad would show up at least once. Why should he though? Like you're working. Was he just gonna like come and hobnob with you? You're doing official military business. Your dad doesn't come to work. Okay. Never once was I like, Hey dad, how come you never come see me teach? Dad, if you really cared about me, you'd come sit in the back of my classroom. Like that doesn't even make sense. Smile. What's wrong with this man? Nobody can ever do anything to please him. Okay. So that, but then one day Pa does decide to show up and he says that Pa had always loved hard work and he loved the fact that Harry had found something that he really was enjoying. Well, um, he comes and they have this like lovely moment where Pa sees what he's doing, and what he's capable of. And then we have this bizarre passage. I mean, I found truly bizarre. I couldn't even sort out what I had just read. So, you know, he's like pretending to call in air support, pretending to dispatch them to destroy things. Okay. So he's not actually destroying anything, but he's pretending it and he's supposed to be thinking about it. He says right here, listen to this. I love seeing Pa, love feeling his pride, and I felt buoyed by his praise. But I had to get back to work. I was mid-control. I couldn't tell the typhoon to please hold a moment. Yes, yes, darling boy, back to work. He drove off, and as he went down the track, I told the typhoon. New target. Gray Audi. Heading southwest from my position down track, toward the big silver barn oriented east-west. The typhoon tracked Pa, did a low pass straight over him, almost shattering the windows of his Audi but ultimately spared him on my orders. It went on to blow up the silver barn instead. That's bizarre. You, you, you fake pretended to go get your dad? You fake pretended to go blow your dad up and then in the last second decided against it? Like, was he trying to give his dad like a fun thrill? Like, like it's kind of fun to, you know, see this Passover? I mean, I don't know what exactly that was. He, he didn't seem to say anything. Like, it wasn't, there's nothing in this passage that's like, Pa would have loved this. Like, this would have been really, like, thrilling to him. He would have thought this was really cool. I mean, he got, well, he does say that his dad flew helicopters, and so he loved seeing Harry in charge of, you know, these fleets of um, helicopters. But it's just weird, like, but I ultimately spared him on my orders. You fake pretended to kill your dad? Like, I wanna check yourself, cause that's weird. <laughs> okay, so anyway, um, we come to the part of the book that we've been waiting for, for 130 pages. And this is the part in which he finally realizes, 10 years later, that mummy is actually dead. Um, the World Rugby World Cup is taking place and it's taking place in Paris where he had never been. And I'm like, you are in your 20s and you've never been to Paris and you live like a hop, skip and a jump away. What is wrong with you? Okay, that's crazy to me. Um, anyway, he'd never been to Paris, but he's going now. And when he goes, when he gets to Paris, he suddenly has this brilliant plan that what he's going to do is go down the tunnel where mommy died because... He needs to see the scene of the crime. He needs to see that dark, twisty tunnel in which his mother passed her last moments on this earth or snuck away. And remember last time we talked, he said there wasn't any possible way that the, you know, that the accident was because the driver had been drunk. There just wasn't any way that could have been true. I mean, you know, we couldn't ask him if he was drunk. So how do we even know if he was? Oh dear Harry, have you ever heard of a blood test? You ever, you heard of that, that? Anyway, he says there was no possible way for that. And it was definitely the paparazzi. So quit blaming it on the guy who's, you know, drinking and driving. It wasn't that guy's fault. 
So he tells the driver, go down that tunnel. You know where that tunnel is? I'll tell you where it is. And the driver's like, well, I mean, I know where it is, but I don't know if I, you know. He says, um, well, I, I, I want you to go down it and I want you to show me exactly where it happened. So they, the driver takes him down the tunnel and it's nothing. It's just this straight, regular old tunnel. It's not like a big thing. It, it, it's not dark and twisty and turny. It's a regularly lit, short, straight tunnel. There is no reason, according to Harry, that there should have been an accident in this tunnel unless the driver had been being pursued hotly by the paparazzi. And he says that the, the he, what he had learned is that the car was only going 65 miles an hour and he wanted the driver to drive exactly at that speed. And he wanted to sort of reenact the night. Okay, so he says there wasn't any reason and that you could have been blitzed out of your head and you would have been able to drive, drive that distance. Well, he would know. Um, so he says that it couldn't have been that the guy was drinking. The only reason that there was an accident was because of the demon paparazzi. But he says that he had gone down that tunnel hoping once again to be reminded, hoping once again to find hope that she had just disappeared. In this, the same way that he had worked it out when he had looked at the pictures from the files. He looked at those pictures and thought, I'm not deterred. These prove nothing. She looks fine. And so he went on believing for several more years that she had just disappeared. But there was something about going down this tunnel that sort of broke apart that fantasy. He says, it had been a very bad idea. I'd had plenty of bad ideas in my 23 years, but this one was uniquely ill-conceived. I told myself that I wanted closure, but I didn't really. Deep down, I'd hoped to feel in that tunnel what I felt when JLP gave me the police files. Disbelief. Doubt. Instead, that was the night all doubt fell away. She's dead, I thought. My God, she's really gone for good. I got the closure I was pretending to seek. I got it in spades. And now I'd never be able to be rid of it. Okay, well, he's never gonna be able to be rid of that, of the doubt. Now he knows she's dead. But what he's got instead is the grand prize of more things to be angry about. So now what he's got is a, is a revitalized reason for outrage. Okay, now he gets to be angry all the time because mummy really is dead. See, before he could like live on the edge of anger because she disappeared and where was she? And that was frustrating. But now she's really dead and he knows who did it paparazzi it's their fault it's their fault he doesn't have a mother so now he gets to drink more he gets to rage more he gets to abuse others and you guys we're coming to a passage where he just doesn't seem to have any wherewithal about the person he's describing because he wrote this book to tell us the man that he has become i'm waiting to get to the part where he just becomes an adolescent like we're, we're, we're he is a toddler okay a toddler, use some tantrums that he's about to wage on those around him. So he says that that night he uh, he was devastated by what suddenly he realized. I have no idea what it was about the tunnel that bestowed this truth on him, but something about the tunnel illuminated his understanding. He said it was close to one o'clock in the morning. The driver dropped me and Billy at a bar where I drank and drank. Some mates were there. I drank with them and I tried to pick fights with several. When the pub threw us out, when Billy the Rock escorted me back to the hotel, I tried to pick a fight with him too. I growled at him, swung on him, slapped his head. He barely reacted. He just frowned like an ultra patient parent. I slapped him again. I loved him, but I was determined to hurt him. He'd seen me like this before. Once, maybe twice, I'd heard him say to another bodyguard, he's a handful tonight. Oh, you don't want to see a handful? Here you go, here's a handful. This is what he writes in this book, describing himself. The night, he's 23 years old, okay? He has had 11 years to realize that his mother is dead. 10 at the least. And it's his fault he hasn't come to this conclusion yet. Okay, you can make your little fantasy world when you're 12 going on 13 and you can't cope, okay? 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, he finally realizes his mom is dead. Okay, now you want to slap around your bodyguard because you finally came to the conclusion that mommy's not coming back? What the hell is wrong with this man? Is it the fault of your bodyguard that it took you so long that you're so thick that 10 years later you're finally like, hey, mom's dead. I, I am speechless. 
How can he act like this? And how can he write about it without any kind of regret that he would behave this way? Like, I can't believe that it took me this long to figure it out. And I was so abusive to the, to the people around me because I was angry with myself for taking so long to come to this conclusion. But he does not own, he does not own his behavior in the least. It's like he's owed this behavior. Like since he just realized his mom's dead, he's allowed to be really mean and abusive because he just found out his mom's dead. 10 years later. Okay. We gotta move on. Um, so he, again, does the things he, okay. so. He's super angry, super upset. He goes to his room. They shut the door on him. He can't get to sleep. He's just too worked up about what has just happened, what he has just found out, what revelations have been revealed, what, what epiphanies have just risen before his eyes. And so he says that the bodyguards put him to bed and shut the door. And then he decides to sneak out. His poor bodyguard is asleep at the door. And he tiptoes past that guy and he does the thing, the unthinkable. He goes out by himself without protection and he wanders the streets until the sun comes up and just plodding along in his disbelief and in his, um, in his aggrieved state. He called William and told William about his night. Again, going to your arch nemesis for comfort. Why does he always do this? He says every single time that he's disappointed in this book. Then I went and talked to William. Every time, without exception, every time there's something disappointing in his life, he says, then I bring William. I ask William's advice. I look to William to comfort me. Okay. You can't tell me in the prologue that this is your arch nemesis and then go on to describe every single time you ever went to him and how he was always the person you'd go to. Okay. So whatever. And it's not like he ever says, William and I were so close. I mean, we had always been so close. No, throughout this entire book, every time he goes and talks to William, he undercuts everything William says with, but William didn't really care with what, what I thought. Then why are you still going to him? Get a new friend then. Oh wait, that's impossible for a person with your personality. Okay, so anyway, he says that he talked to William and he found out that William had actually driven the tunnel himself too. And that they commiserated about the fact that a report had finally been completed about the death of their mother and they found it shoddy and full of holes and that it really should be redone. And that they together decided that they were going to recall, they were going to call for a reopening of these files and for them to be looked at again and for some new conclusions to be drawn. But of course, who should step in the way? The palace, the powers of be, you know, stole that one right from him too. And that is where we're going to end with him finally realizing 10 years later that mummy's dead. Um, next time we read, we are going to um, get into him actually leaving for Afghanistan. He's gotten the much coveted job um and i mean who didn't of course he was going to get the the coveted job none of us were sitting on the edge of our seats wondering if it was going to happen for him um but anyway he's gotten the much coveted job and he will go off to afghanistan and maybe we'll find out what happens officially with him and chelsea he did not say they had broken up so it sounds like they just had a hard conversation as i mean what couple hasn't had a hard conversation but um his response i don't think is going to uh embolden her to want to move further into their relationship he doesn't sound like he's super into it um and i i just really disliked him in this in this entire passage i mean i have disliked him for a while I, I i was feeling real cold towards him on the passages about pat and how abusive he was about pat with pat but these passages really bothered me also i cannot get over how he wants to compare the paparazzi to terrorists it's not the same, Harry. It, it actually isn't the same. And I cannot get past the fact that he would, he would think it's completely appropriate for him to use and abuse his friends and bodyguards because he's disappointed with reality. Nope, can't get past that. I don't understand why he'd throw shade at Pa for not coming and visiting him at work when he knows he's on official military business and he's in the middle of training. You don't get to be mad at your dad for not showing up at work and patting you on the back. Mm -mm, sorry. No grown man would be like, dad didn't come to work today. Dad didn't come and see what I was doing and tell me I'm doing a good job. Oh, how, 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 how does it, how does he continue to be this way? I've been trying to, I mean, uh, as much as I can cut this person some slack, I'm trying. I truly am trying to cut this person some slack. He's a human being, crazy though he may be, but then he does and says things that just make it so hard to sympathize with him.
I can't do it. Okay. Well, to next time when I see you on Sunday, we will be continuing on in our stories together. Again, bring that sick bucket because it ain't getting better from here. Okay. This was the most disgusting passage. One of the, one of the many disgusting passages we've read in this book that really revealed the character of this man. And, um, you know, I hope that Chelsea hurries up and breaks up with him because I feel really sorry for her. Okay. See you Sunday. Bye.